Hello inmates, this is Peishi, and this is Scorch number 20, which I won. And I am very excited to be recording a Scorch today, but also in unnecessary news that I would like to share with y'all, as I do. Today is the day that my middlest sibling is graduating from high school. So everybody should throw a congratulations down in the comments for that, because it was an effort. Um, and interestingly enough, fun fact about this sibling, interested in being a writer, so participated in the Sublock Scorch a few times, I believe less than 10 times probably, and one I think twice, which actually means that this sibling has a better uh, ratio of wins to losses than anybody else in the Scorch, due to us writing a lot more often. Anyway... Those scorches uh, will be lost to time and never come up because that sibling is not a part of Stellacore. Anyway, fun fact. All right, so this scorch that I'm about to read to you is from the prompt that Cricket gave that's a painting. So I'm sure you can look that up based on Cricket's comments from the prompt or possibly there will also be the picture somewhere on the Patreon. But it's basically, I'll describe how I see it, okay? <laughs> Cricket gave all this praise and stuff. I think it's a landscape, very dreary, very foreboding, and there's this ugly, like, decrepit piece of a building that's crumbling down, and there's all these dead trees everywhere, and there's kind of this fog. Anyway, that's the painting. So that's the prompt. And this story is one that I wrote kind of from the perspective of telling a story to a child, which I actually have a few that are like that because I have a fair amount of younger siblings. So I like kind of that storyteller vibe. Oh, important point. The one of the parts of this story that is my favorite hinges on wordplay. So the very last word of the story will be a word that is different from a word that sounds the same that I've been using the rest of the time. And uh, you can't hear it. So I guess I'll, I'll mention it right after, but um, it's just kind of sad that it doesn't come across through audio. So uh, follow along in the transcript or something, I guess. Uh, anyway, this is a Scorch I'm actually really proud of. I really liked this one. So, I called it Forest of the Dead. And without further ado, here we go. Once upon a time, in what seems another world, there dwelt a village that drew its name from its Forest of the Dead. They called it Nightwood. What is a Forest of the Dead? Well, my darling dearest, in this kingdom, every village buried their dead with seeds. There weren't any cemeteries. Instead, trees grew from the soil where the dead lay sleeping. Life's cycle of renewal created pretty forests in every village. Every village but Nightwood, that is. Remember, my darling dearest, that Nightwood was named for its forest. Theirs grew differently than the rest. Every tree from tiny seedling to giant oak was gnarled and twisted and didn't grow leaves in any season. The villagers grew afraid of the forest. It was dark and frightening, and the trees appeared as dead as those buried there. Over time, superstitions sprang up, horror stories about what might lurk in the dead woods on the edge of town. The people's fear became so great, they stopped going to visit their dead, even on anniversaries. They never entered the forest except to feed it with more of their dead. The focus of our story, my darling dearest, is a series of peculiar circumstances that took place deep within the woods themselves. But our story begins in the village, in the chapel, during a perfectly lovely little wedding. The young couple was, by all accounts, entirely ordinary. They shared a sweet, profound love that could be found in many a home in Nightwood. Neither Thomas nor Catherine had ever entered the Forest of the Dead. Soon after the wedding, the kingdom called the village to yield soldiers for a war. Thomas, Young and brave, answered the call. Untrained, he was heavily wounded. His companions pulled him back to the surgeon's tent, 
where he lay for hours on a stretcher, covered in blood. The surgeon finished stitching him up and sent him home. His injuries became infected along the way. His friends carefully delivered him to the home of the village healer. She settled him in a bedroom off to the side, too busy to treat him yet now. She was guiding a young woman as she delivered her child. Catherine had discovered her pregnancy during Thomas's absence. It happened, my darling dearest, that Thomas had the chance to hold Emily in his arms and name her before he passed away. Catherine brought her babe to the funeral, held in the crumbling stone hall before the forest. Many mourned Thomas's passing, for he was well liked in the village. After the funeral, Catherine accompanied the caretaker to the burial itself. She took note of the large maple tree her love slept beneath, making sure to remember exactly where it was. She wanted Emily to know her father. Catherine took her to the empty, menacing grove often. She rocked the baby under the great maple and sang her lullabies. When Emily grew old enough to understand, her mother sat beside her on a crooked elm and told her stories about a brave soldier boy and his pretty wife. The young seamstress taught her daughter to climb among the rugged old birches in the forest, to write with its branches, to sew and to sing and to dance among the trees. They were in the forest more often than at home. Occasionally in their outings, they found stray flowers and lone trees scattered with leaves. Emily grew up in the darkest forest of the dead, and her village thought her strange. She came of age, her mother passed, and the men considered her for marriage. Were it simply a question of her beauty, they said, she'd be an excellent choice. But how strange was a girl who danced among the dead. They passed her over. They didn't know, my darling dearest. There was a boy she'd met several times in their youth, stumbled across in the forest. The blacksmith's son, visiting his elder brother, killed in a fire years ago. Emily and Aaron saw each other many times throughout their childhood, and as adults, they sought one another in the woods. The villagers were shocked when they announced their engagement. But it was worse. They wanted to be married in the funeral hall. And then they built their house and smithy in a clearing in the middle of the forest. A forest that had of late begun to flower and bring forth leaves. No one visited them, but they trekked back and forth to see the village and sell their wares. After several years, the forest was unrecognizable, my darling dearest. With Emily and Aaron in their midst, the trees had awakened. Every tree had leaves. The forest floor was blanketed with flowers, and fruit came forth in abundance. Still, the villagers were afraid. One day, Aaron left early in the morning for the village to take orders for his smithy. Emily left around noon to meet him with lunch. Halfway there, a storm came out of nowhere. The sky was black with clouds. Lightning struck nearby. Thorny brambles sprang up around Emily, and she couldn't break free. She struggled against vicious roots falling in the mud. She could feel the danger in the air. She knew the trees she trusted wouldn't hurt her without good reason, and she feared what it meant for the village. For hours she lay in the mud, bound by roots, screaming her throat ragged for Aaron. The rain let up in the same moment that the forest released her. She burst to her feet and ran, shrieking her husband's name. The whole forest seemed to have lost its leaves, dark and menacing. Emily had never feared these woods before, and, my darling dearest, she wouldn't now. She beseeched the trees. Why didn't you stop him too? Where is he? Aaron! Aaron! She found herself at the very edge of the woods, still screaming his name. At once, she heard an answering cry and turned to see him bound with living branches to a tree, which released him to her. Together they ventured, filled with dread, into the village. Nightwood was silent. Every home was empty. The ground was spattered with blood. A roving clan had attacked and attempted to raise the village to the ground. The storm put out the fire, but not a villager remained. Again, Emily screamed at the forest. Why didn't you protect them? You protected us. Why? Aaron's hand on her arm cut her off. He pointed to the old stone hall. It was covered 
and vines and creepers. Huge lengths of oak barred the door. Every visible bit of wood bore axe marks. The couple clung to each other and entered the hall, branches yielding before them. Many years later, the village could be found writhing entirely within the forest. They had run to it, and it had saved them. They lived in the forest of the dead, and it became a merry orchard. Their homes were made from the wood that protected them. All that remained of the previous menace was a single stone archway from the hall and a row of scraggly trees coated in fog. Each visitor had to pass through the thre- mm-hmm. Each visitor had to pass through the threatening trees in order to find the beautiful village city in the woods. Once upon a time, in what seems another world, there dwelt a village that drew its name from its forest of the dead. They called it Nightwood. <laughs> Am I irrepressible thoughts of debt, Barbie? <laughs> Oh, it's Cricket here for judges' comments. We'll get we'll get back to thoughts of death. First off, I love this piece from Peshu. It's so good. I love like the fairy tale aspect of it, the storytelling. It's so magical, and then the way that like it progresses and everything. And then I love, love, love the twist at the end, where this place has been called the Nightwood, and it's spelled night, like you know, darkness and scary, but then at the end, after the forest protects the whole village, they call it the Nightwood, but spelled with a K, like it's a defender. And I love this idea of everyone who lives near it completely reevaluating their relationship to this forest and calling it something that sounds the same, but means something so different, I think is so cool. And I love also that this, to me, it feels like the person telling the story is probably someone who lives there and they're explaining it to their kid. And I think that's so lovely. Bones' piece this week was also super good. It was a just a fun little Maestroverse adventure. And I think it's canon verse Maestroverse. I don't think it's doing anything weird. Um, it was fun. It was funny. But there was just like something about the tone of Pesci's that I felt like suited my prompt image so well. And I really just enjoyed it but (laughs) am i irrepressible thoughts of death barbie i pulled up the stats to look at this of the six times this is week 20 i have judged at that point six of the scorches week 20 is the sixth one i judged two of the ones that i picked as winners heavily dealt with death um this one and also the dancing blue from week 14 um Two out of six, that's a third of the pieces heavily deal with death. And then looking through of the 14 I've written up to that point, at least four of them also heavily deal with death. I'm like, what? I don't know. Themes I keep coming back to, I guess. Death is an important part of life, but it's just funny to see that so often. And I'm like, this is the beginning of 2018. I hadn't had any recent deaths in my life. Like, I don't know. Um, It's funny looking back on this and like seeing patterns like that show up. But anyway, mostly I picked this, I picked Pesci's just because I really, I felt like it suited the mood of the picture Abby in the Oakwood. I really liked it. It surprised me several times. And then just the the play on words, the change from Nightwood to Nightwood with a K. Ugh, it made me so happy. I like this piece so, so much. Okay, so I really like this story. Um, I like the little nonsensical additions of my darling dearest for the storytelling parts. And I love how, so in the beginning when it's called Nightwood, it's spelled N-I-G-H-T, right? Night, like the nighttime, like darkness, scary. And at the end, it's Nightwood with a K, like a knight to protect them. And I just really love this story because, um, I don't know, there's a lot of emotional cues in it that I that speak to me, I want to say, but I wrote it, of course it speaks to me, Um, that I hope spoke to you a little bit, I guess. Uh, The idea that the spirits of the dead remained in the forest a little bit, and that the forest died as people stopped visiting, that they needed to come and acknowledge their dead in order for there to be life, that kind of cycle. And then when the forest was living, that it was able to do something for the villagers to protect them, Um, I think it's good to 
acknowledge death in our lives because death is a part of life and part of the cycle of life. And I believe that the spirits of our dead, that our ancestors do watch out for us. So I really liked including that a little bit in the story. And I liked too the, the moment where Catherine had to be a single mother, but she wanted her child to know her father anyway. And just the, the little tragedy of having lost him to war and everything. It just, to me, I feel like I successfully captured kind of those feelings of things that are, can be so big and dramatic, but are also so simple, you know? Anyway, I really like this Scorch. I'm not, there's a lot of Scorches I look back on and I'm like, wow, who wrote that? But uh, I'm proud of this one. This one was good. Anyway, I hope you guys liked it. I prompted for the next week and I, which will be 21, so it's guests receive a raucous welcome and the reaction devastates their hosts. Hmm, I'm not exactly sure where that came from, but hopefully it will be a very exciting scorch for you to listen to. According to the summary note, it will be very exciting. It will be a character that you guys can recognize, so that's fun. Anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for listening, and keep those fires burning, y'all. The Cell Block Scorch is a production of StellaCore, an independent group of nerds sharing their obsessions with the world. We can be reached at thestellacore at gmail.com, through comments on your podcast platform of choice, our Instagram, Stella underscore core, and at our YouTube, also called StellaCore. Feel free to check out our other productions on our YouTube channel, or our cosplays on Instagram. If you would like to support our creative endeavors, you can give a one-time tip to the ko-fi of the writer of your favorite Scorches, or check out our Patreon, linked in the show notes. There, you can access the winning Scorches and episode transcripts for free, or sign up for Spark Level support for $5 a month to gain access to all of the Scorch submissions.